Hi, I'm Tom Edwards. I'm a futurist and I'm also the Chief Digital and Data Officer for Omnicom Health Group. Today, we're going to talk about generative AI and specifically ChatGPT. I've been speaking on the topic of AI since 2016, and over the years I've researched across generational cohorts, and I've covered the eyes of the innocent here, because what's consistent is that the primary behavioral driver for why individuals will adopt and engage with intelligent systems, it's tied to ease and convenience, hence the Wally reference here. Now, generative AI is a major step towards ease and convenience for generation of images and various text-based outputs that can fundamentally transform how we work. The non-technical and accessible nature of the tools were a key rallying cry for one of the leaders in the space, OpenAI. So OpenAI is at the forefront of headlines. From their famous founders like Elon Musk and Sam Altman, their stated goal was to develop friendly AI in a way that benefits humanity. They initially pledged a billion dollars upon founding, and their valuation today is north of $29 billion. Some of their products are at the forefront of generative AI, both from a text-based plus visuals, and they're redefining creativity in the process. So we're going to start with the generation of digital images. OpenAI launched Dolly in January of 2021. It's a deep learning model that generates digital images from natural language descriptions called prompts. In April of 2022, Dolly 2 was launched, and it's a leap forward in terms of generating realistic images at higher resolutions that basically can combine concepts, attributes, and styles. So. Moving forward, we need to become familiar with the fact that prompts are going to be the new normal. So definitely become familiar with the term, especially when talking about generative AI, both for visual and for text. And it's surprisingly more sophisticated than streaming a few words together. And that's simply a kind of a core prompt. You have to consider multiple elements associated with style. Is it realistic? Is it an oil painting? Is it a pencil drawing? Is it concept art? What's the artist space type style? Are there any advanced prompt weighting associated with it? These are prompts plus negative prompts. Basically, what do you want to show? How it's weighted, but also what you don't want to see in a finished image. Generative AI is going to redefine how visual images are crafted, and the prompts and art expertise to create these are going to be key. Prompt engineering is going to be a new role. Now, let's talk Transformers for just a minute. I'm a Generation 1 Transformer fan. I know some of you may prefer the Michael Bay movie style of Transformers, but in all seriousness, the GPT part of ChatGPT means Generative Pre-trained Transformer. It's basically a large language model. It uses 175 billion parameters that are fed into a deep learning system that's basically AI that learns on its own to produce human-like text. So given an initial text as a prompt, it will then transform that text in, and then continue on with that prompt. So for now, you'll see a number of startups using the public API to fuel their GPT experiences. Again, this is foundational for ChatGPT. ChatGPT is the chatbot version of GPT. It's launched by OpenAI in November of 2022, and it's built on top of OpenAI's GPT 3.5 family of large language models. Now. You can see from this slide that it took ChatGPT only five days to reach a million users. If you've been on the platform recently, you're constantly graded with at capacity prompts. So let's ask ourselves, do we believe the hype? Is this like we're traveling through a wormhole and we've seen the future in terms of how we're going to work moving forward? Maybe so. And what does this potentially mean for industries like the pharma industry? Let's dive into that. I'm a big believer in intelligence augmentation and that AI and intelligent systems are going to enhance how we work. So much so that the rest of this section is actually going to come from chat GPT prompts. So you see, we're quickly evolving from being authors to actually editors. So as you can see, chat GPT crafted all of the content that was on the previous slide. So, Let's get into some of the actual applications that a global pharmaceutical company can use, chat, how they can use ChatGPT. We're going to start broad, and then we're going to narrow in specifically to marketing. Now, from an organizational standpoint, things like customer service and reducing the workload on that specific team, providing 24-7 answers, drug discovery that can help researchers identify new areas of interest, potentially speeding up the drug development process, medical writing, creating accurate and easy to understand materials, uh, for healthcare professionals, medical information can help basically improve accessibility of accurate information, content creation, and so much more. 
So this is just scratching the surface of what's possible for a large organization. If you happen to be a marketer within one of those organizations, here's kind of a list that you can consider here. So from generating personalized and engaging content, creating FAQs, conducting market research, assisting with product literature, developing and testing ad copy, generating reports and summaries, creating summaries of scientific studies, creating eBooks and white papers, simulating clinical and non-clinical conversations with physicians and patients for sales rep training. There's so much more that can be done here. Now, let's shift for a moment from what ChatGPT does and now let's focus on how it's going to impact different business models. ChatGPT and generative AI can streamline how we work from automation of repetitive tasks to real-time insights. So it's incredibly impressive when we start thinking about, you know, all the core things that it can potentially do to help streamline how we work and how we, we operate. The other thing to consider here is also this acceleration between human and tech collaboration. Going back to our earlier discussion, tools like ChatGPT accelerate human and tech collaboration. So again, this is enhancing how we work and this collection and collaboration between AI and humans to the point that humans are going to have AI coworkers or teammates that are gonna essentially be proxies of them on their specific teams handling certain functions and driving this whole idea of intelligence augmentation. So another core thing to consider is enhancing content creation and customer experience. At its core, content creation by channel is possible based on the prompts used. And it's not only about content creation, but also enhancing the overall customer experience. Now let's focus a little bit on quality and efficiency. Efficiency can definitely be gained by using generative AI from language generation, personalization responses, automation, quality control via parameters around engaging content. This is just one of the biggest value propositions of leveraging large language models like ChatGPT. The other thing that you can also do is craft content by audience. And this is really impressive. In this example, ChatGPT explains cancer to a 10 year old, and as well as also using a sports analogy. So as you think about crafting messaging by audience and the different types of individuals, there can be context applied to this to drive a certain type of messaging. So pulling it now out towards kind of how is this impacting industry? Since September 22nd, 2020, Microsoft has an exclusive license for the use of GPT-3. Others can use the public API to receive output for now, but Microsoft has access to GPT-3's underlying model. And OpenAI recently opened up a waitlist for ChatGPT Professional. Microsoft's investments can allow them to take up to 75% of the revenue gained from ChatGPT Professional and the subsequent API as they are the exclusive license holder and they're looking to invest another $10 billion into GPT. Some of the questions are tied to how would you consider, how much would you consider paying for chat GPT per month and hinting at a fee potentially for their API. So that's, that's great for chat GPT and for Microsoft, but what about, what about Google? So the ability for chat GPT to serve information in a clear, precise, simple sentence, rather than a list of links, and its ability to explain concepts that are easy to understand could be seen as a threat to Google's business model. 80% of the revenue is actually tied to search, and that entire business is built on referral and authority. If there's a solution that provides quick answers to a question, this puts Google in an uncomfortable position. Basically, think about if Microsoft was to integrate this into Bing and what that would mean to kind of the search wars. But Google being Google, they have a plan. So DeepMind was actually founded in 2010, and this is the AI division of Alphabet. It's their deep learning system, and this is one that actually beat an AlphaGo human champion back in 2015. So DeepMind has been working on Sparrow. Sparrow is DeepMind's chatbot. It's gonna mix human feedback and Google search suggestions, and they're trying to bridge the existing model, and they're also looking to cite sources in 2023. That's a big point of difference from how ChatGPT currently operates and what Google's proposing. So one of the core issues with ChatGPT is that it's only as good as the data that it's trained itself on. And in some instances, I've seen ChatGPT deliver answers with such confidence that if I didn't know the answer, I would have believed it. Also, there's no sourcing with ChatGPT. So it's developing responses based on its previous learning, but at the same time, doesn't necessarily tell you where all the data is sourced from. 
and also there are ethical and IP concerns with some of the generative AI platforms that are out there today. So as we're looking at these various models, things tied to privacy, bias, and accountability definitely come to mind, but also so does IP, so intellectual property. So the data used to train the models, which is often proprietary, is collected by third parties. Because again, these models are trained on some open web data. So moreover, using a language model like ChatGPT is a commercial, in a commercial setting, or if you're generating content for publication, it may raise issues related to copyright infringement. So you have to take steps to ensure that the model is used in a responsible and legal manner. My recommendation is to proceed with caution. ChatGPT is a very powerful tool with a lot of possible benefits to an organization. However, it's very important to remember that it's a starting point. It's not an endpoint. You still need experts to drive business decisions with outputs from ChatGPT. Again, it's going back to the idea of becoming editors instead of authors. Also, when you think about healthcare stakeholders and how you begin to build trust, there are a number of things that need to take place. It's transparency and explainability, it's validation of the models, it's auditing for bias, it's continual monitoring and updating, it's having domain expertise, it's understanding some of the core limitations of the models, and most importantly, having data governance and ethics policies that are very transparent. And if you're thinking about how do I, how do I deploy GPT within my organization, so the basic gist for now is that you know, there, there are a couple ways you could do this. So you can actually take four of the underlying GPT models, which I've listed on the screen here from DaVinci and Curie and Babbage and Ada, and you can actually combine them into an Azure um, environment and actually train and tune those models specific to how your business operates. That's one way that you can kind of go about that. And my final point in this entire presentation, again, it's this idea, and this is the theme of the discussion today, whether it's generative digital images or copy, an anchor point is to understand that these are starting points, not the end product. The models can only take it so far, but don't always understand the nuances tied to organizational culture and brand guidelines or governance policies. So that's it. Thank you again for joining me today. Be on the lookout for more content coming soon.